If you have a Bible, go with me over to Genesis 50, 20. I think the worship took some of my time today, so we're going to try to catch up here. I love them, though. Today we're continuing in our 16-part series entitled The Sweet Place. Somebody shout The Sweet Place. About a year and a half ago, I was going to my Christian counselor, and he normally starts off the session saying, Ken, how is everything in your life? This day, I flipped the question around to my counselor. I said, how's everything with you? And my counselor is 73 years old. He's been through a lot in his life, and he looked at me with tears in his eyes, and he says, Ken, I'm in a sweet place with Jesus. And I left that meeting, and that phrase stuck in my heart. It was like the Holy Spirit jumped on it. And I said, when I'm 73 years old, I don't care what I've been through in my life, I want to be able to say I'm, I'm in a sweet place with Jesus. How many of you all are with me today? And so I came back and I told our staff, I said, for the next 12 months, I'm going to do everything I can to live in a sweet place with Jesus. And then 2025 will be our year of communion, which simply means closeness to God, fellowship with God. We're going to really focus on having a great relationship with God, intimacy with God. I'm going to pay for it, everything that I learned over the year, and this is going to be our year of communion. Welcome to the next level, everybody, all right? And so this is the sweet place, and today we're on part number four of this 16-part series, and we're going to call this part Healing the Hurts. Everybody say Healing the Hurts. Healing the hurts. How many of you all have ever been hurt before? Let me see by a show of hands. How many of you all um, have been hurt recently by somebody or something? Let me see by a show of hands. How many of you all know that if you continue to love people and walk by faith, there's a great chance that you're going to be hurt again in the future, but you still got to love them anyway. You still got to walk by faith anyway. This is a message for today. God wants to heal some of your hurt today. Um, I want to look at the life of Joseph. So some of you all are newer to church, so I want to explain in just a moment, but I want to start at Genesis 50:20. And if you don't mind, let's all read the scripture together. Genesis 50, 20. Ready, read. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done to the saving. And the church said, a. This is the statement that I've been meditating on that Joseph made back in Genesis 50, 20. For those of you all who are newer to church, let me explain. Joseph is the son of a guy named Jacob. In the Bible, the name Jacob in Israel is the same, um, you know, as the father of Joseph. Um, from Israel, you get the 12 tribes of Israel, which is basically the 12 sons of Israel. The 11th son is Joseph, and the Bible says that Joseph is favored by his father because he is the son of his old age. Joseph wasn't just favored by Jacob, he was also favored by God. He was a dreamer. God gave Joseph a dream that at one point in time, he would have authority over his brothers and even over his father and mother, they would bow down and pay homage to him. So his brothers, his own family hated him because he was favored and they hated him because of his dream. Have you ever had family members or people that are close to you that should love you, but they hate you? They might not even say it up front, but you can tell by the way they act around you. This was Joseph's scenario. He was hated by people that should have loved him. How many of you all have older siblings? You have older siblings, all right? How many of you all kind of looked up to your older sibling at some point in your life? I mean, you're growing up through middle school and high school, and you see what they're doing, and even if you don't say it, you kind of look up to your older sibling, and then I'm sure that's what Joseph did. He was looking up to his older brothers, but his older brothers wanted to kill him. There came a day in time where he came in, and he was trying to bring a message from his father to his older brothers, and they say, there goes that, there goes that dreamer. And his brothers conspired together to kill him. They threw Joseph over in a pit and left him for dead, but then felt bad about it just a little bit and said, don't let his blood be upon our hands. So they pulled him out of the pit, and then they sold him into slavery. Think about the hurt. Think about the rejection here. Think about the abandonment. I mean, these are the people that should have his back, that should be teaching him things about life, but they're selling him into slavery. Joseph goes into Egyptian slavery, and he's bought out of slavery by an Egyptian guard named Potiphar, but Potiphar's wife lies on Joseph, and, he, and she makes up charges against him and has him thrown in prison, and he's there for years. And then he interprets a dream for Pharaoh, and he goes from the prison into the palace, and he begins to walk in the dream that God gave him many, many years ago. And there came a famine in the land, and all of the people came to Egypt where Joseph was second in control to buy food. And here comes his brothers. 
This is about 20 years later. They come and the dream comes to pass. They bow down to Joseph, not even knowing that it's Joseph because they're in need of food. What does Joseph do? He forgives them. He acts like nothing ever happens. Matter of fact, he vows to take care of them and their family for the rest of his life. He brings all of his family to Egypt. Then there comes a day where Jacob dies. Joseph's father dies and his brothers say this, man, maybe he's going to pay us back now for all of the wrong that we did to him. And that's where Joseph says, Genesis 50, 20. And this is what he says in this moment, 20 plus years later, think about the hurt, the abandonment, the betrayal, the rejection. He didn't even know who his family was. They thought that he was dead. And he says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done to the saving of many lives. This statement is filled with so much revelation. Not only does it speak to Joseph's ability to reframe his pain, it also speaks to the fact that he didn't let hurt stay in his heart. He was hurt, betrayed, ridiculed, abandoned, sold into slavery, but he didn't let hurt have him. There are some of us today that you're letting hurt have you and hurt is stopping what God wants to be in your life. And you have to allow the Spirit of God to heal your hurts today. This is a message for today. And my hope is when you leave out of this place, you'll be like a Joseph. You'll be able to say, you meant it for my harm, but God meant it for my good. I prophesy that over you, that you'll be able to take whatever pain you've been through to the saving of many lives. How many of you all know that if you're not dead, God's not done? Come on, somebody. Your best days are still out in front of you. It don't matter what you've been up against. Some of you all have fought addiction. You fought an addiction. God's going to free you so you can free others. Some of you all have battled depression. God's about to heal you so you can go heal others. It wasn't for your harm. It's to do what God wants to do in the future. You got to overcome the hurt, though. Are you with me today? And so why are we talking about this? It's hard to be intimate and close to God if you're hurt. It's hard to live at a nine and carry the hurt. It's hard to live in a sweet place. But you got so much hurt in your heart. God wants to heal your hurt today. So what is hurt? The Webster's Dictionary defines it two ways, and I'm going to stick with the second definition, but the first one is bodily injury or wound. We're not talking about that one today. We're going to look at number two, mental or emotional distress or anguish, mental or emotional suffering. For example, when you overcome the hurt of a bitter divorce, that, that, that's emotional hurt. Practically speaking, if you're taking notes, it is emotional pain caused by somebody else. How many of you all have ever had pain caused by somebody else? It is emotional pain caused by something that happened to you that you did not want or expect. For example, you thought things were going to go one way, but they went another way. Hurt. You thought that people would be there for you, but they were nowhere around. Hurt. You put your trust in somebody, but they let you down. You thought God was going to do something for you by a certain time, but he didn't. You feel like you did so much for somebody, but they did so little for you. They didn't see you. They didn't notice you. They didn't appreciate you. They didn't use you. They used you too much. They didn't prefer you. They didn't help you when you needed help. And you're left with what? Hurt. And today we want to help you get rid of the hurt. The hurt of abandonment. Somebody left you that should never have left you. They left the relationship. God wants to heal that hurt today. Somebody say amen. amen. The hurt of rejection. Somebody that should have stood with you, they rejected you. They said you wasn't smart enough, that you wasn't pretty enough, that you were too this or too that. God wants to heal that hurt today. The hurt of father wounds or mother wounds. There was a dad that was absent, a mother that didn't love you like she should have loved you. God wants to heal that hurt today. There was a hurt of a loss. I don't know. I don't think Christians are ready for the loss. And in life, there's going to be some loss, the loss of a loved one, the loss of a relationship. God wants to heal you of that hurt today. The hurt of disappointment. You had all the faith in the world and then you got the wind knocked out of you. God wants to heal you of that hurt today. The hurt of abuse. All right. They used you to get what they wanted. They didn't treat you the way you deserve to be treated, but God wants to heal you of that hurt today. And God knows the infamous church hurt. Something happened in your church life. There was a decision that was made that you didn't understand. There was a relationship that used to be close, but it crumbled. God wants to heal you from church hurt today. Would the church say amen? amen. 
And the Lord showed me like a pandemic of hurt. Not just in this church, but in the Big C church around the world, there are so many people called of God, anointed by God, but hurt is suffocating their calling. We have to get healed of this pandemic today. And how do you know if you're dealing with, with hurt, especially church hurt, because many people will go through the motions. So I want to help you today. These are some signs that will show you if you're dealing with some sort of hurt, you, you're sitting on your gifts instead of using your gifts. You used to be on fire for God, but now you're just going through the motions. You used to love the house of God, but now you're more into your house and taking care of your family and your children and your baby. You used to feel called into ministry, but now you just... You kind of come and you kind of, you kind of leave. You used to want to shake the nations, but now you need to bow to the idol of convenience and comfortability. Mm -hmm. You used to be thriving, but now you're just surviving. You used to be bold, but now you're passive. God wants you to fall back in love with your first love again. And many times it's not that you're bad. It's not that you're an evil person. It's just that you got hurt. And whenever you get hurt, you begin to pull back on how God's created you to be, and God wants to heal you today. Some of you all are like, Pastor, but you don't understand my hurt. I understand more than what you think I understand. I've been in ministry for 23 years, y'all. I've ha had the best time of my life in the church. I really have. I've had people stand with me in the darkest moments of my life. I've had people stand with me as my wife was overcoming stage three breast cancer, prayed with me, brought me food to my house stood with me, encouraged me over, we've been pastors now going on 18 years. I've seen people pray with me and serve us and take care of us. I've had some of the best times in the church. I've been in the presence of the Lord where the presence of God would come in so thick it's almost like you couldn't move and you would just cry uncontrollably. I've, I've been in church before and I've seen the blinded eye open. I've seen the deaf ear come undone. I've been in church and seen a person come in in a wheelchair and by the power of God throw the wheelchair over in the corner and walk out on their own two feet. I've been in church before and saw somebody that came in with a leg that was too short and pray and the leg drove back. I've seen creative miracles. I love the church. It's not perfect, but there's power in the church. But I've also been hurt in church before. It's been the place of my greatest joy and also my greatest pain. I've had people that I've loved that hadn't loved me back. There's been people that I've given opportunities to, but they took it for granted. People that say, Pastor, I got your back, and you turn around, them jokers are nowhere around. People that I invited to my inner circle only realize they're more like a Judas than they are a Peter. People that lied about me, stole from me, used me, abused me, didn't even remember my precious milestones. And I'm happy to say today that I got a pure heart. I got a heart like Joseph. And I say that with gravity and humility, but I say that to let you know that it doesn't matter what, you be, what you've been through, you gotta grow through what you go through. Yeah. And you can actually live your life without resentment, without bitterness, without unforgiveness. You can live your life like a Joseph, you can live your life without hurt, you can come to the end and you can say the things that you meant to harm me, God meant it for my good to do what is being done right now to the savings of many lives. So you thought it was personal. It ain't that personal. The devil has a target on your back. He wants to create bondage in your, in your lineage. He wants to deceive you so you deconstruct your faith and you don't even know in this environment what to believe any longer. He wants to give you all kinds of ideologies and philosophies that are void of the power of God. But God is looking for a remnant that is a chosen group of people that won't stay hurt even though we've been hurt. But we allow our hurt to grow the anointing in our life so we can hurt the devil bad. Would somebody say amen? amen. So what I've learned over 23 years of ministry is that we all going to be tempted with hurt. And I think it's just a part of the test that God allows to develop Christ likeness in us. It's a part of your growth journey. I would love to preach to you and say, if you give your heart to Jesus today, you will never be hurt and never be offended. I think it's the opposite. You give your heart to Jesus today, offense is coming tomorrow. <laughs> Come on, hurt is coming next week. It's coming. It's on its way. It's going to try to steal, kill, and destroy you. So I want to get you ready for the battle. I'm telling you the truth today. And if you understand how to get healed from hurt and you don't take things so personal, you will grow in the image of Christ the power of the Spirit will grow in your life.
But if you allow hurt to hurt you, you'll get bitter, resentful, envious. You'll begin to step back. You'll begin to sit on your gifts. You'll begin to look around and judge the church. And you'll say, I don't believe in organized religion. Like who disorganized it? You would never want to work for a disorganized company or root for a disorganized team. Satan is the only one that wants to disorganize the bride. We're better when we come together, but we have to overcome our hurt to be the glorious church without spot or wrinkle. Am I clear with you guys today? Hurt's going to come, but we're going to be ready for it when it comes. And so what does hurt do? Number one, it prevents you from seeing clearly. Are y'all with me? Have you ever been in a a bad rainstorm before? In Florida, I know you have. Think about it. The kind of rainstorm that's like you can't drive your car. You're really thinking, I should pull over. This is not safe. You see other people pulled over under the underpass. You think, I can make it. The speed limit is 65, 70 miles per hour. You're going 25 with your flashes on, right? And that's just with water. But imagine if it was with mud. That's what hurt does. It muddies your perspective to where you can't even see where you're going. If you are hurt of heart, you can't tell the difference between the lie and the truth. Only God can heal your heart so that you can have your discernment back again. Number two, what does hurt do? Write this down. You start to protect yourself more than living in God's protection. Mm -mm -mm. Anybody like boxing by any chance? It's a brutal sport, I know. Stick with me. Hurt boxers lose because they try to protect the hurts. Anybody see the Tyson? Um, Jake Paul fight the other night. We need, we need to get our, that, that waste of time back in our life and repent <laughs> right now, today. Now, I heard you guys had buffering here in America and Netflix was tripping. I was in Brazil and my Netflix was fine. <laughs> but I was two hours ahead of y'all in Brazil, so the fight came on at 2 a.m. And I made myself stay up to watch this horrible fight. And the whole time, what were we thinking? Please don't get hurt. <laughs> We was thinking like, this is going to be real good until we saw him get in the ring. Then we said, well, this is a 58-year-old man, and we were nervous. And it was hard to watch. Why? Because we didn't want Mike, Iron Mike, to get hurt. And actually, the best fight of the night was the women fight that came on before. Am I right? Now, I'm, I hope you don't feel like this is a chauvinistic statement. I don't really like women boxers. I, I, think it's a, I don't really like boxing altogether. It's a little brutal for me, but I don't like all the blood and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I got a wife and daughters and a mother and I don't know, whatever. W- what I'm saying is this. So the two, but this was the best boxing match by far, technically. Okay. So the best two women in the world, they, they, you know, they were fighting each other and this was a rematch. Okay. And the one girl, pop, 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 I mean, for the first three rounds, pop, pop, pop. I mean, she, she floating like a butterfly, stinging like a, I'm talking about the first three rounds. And then I think it was about the fourth round, correct me if I'm wrong. She, uh, other girl came up, uh, and headbutted her and slit her eye wide open. I mean, why, blood is coming all down her face. I t- this is why I don't like this stuff, right? Then from that moment on, what does she do? She protects her hurt. So now she goes from offense to defense. Now she goes from being the aggressor that I can't get hurt again because if I get hurt again, they might stop the fight. So now instead of thinking about how I can be aggressive and move, now I'm moving back because I just don't want to, and some of you all are like that in your walk with Jesus. You're trying to do everything you can just not to be hurt again. I don't want to be, I don't want to be, I don't, I don't want to be betrayed again. I don't want to put my heart on the line again. I don't want to get in a small group. I don't want to be vulnerable again because I got hurt before. But if you get, if you're protecting your hurt, you're not letting God protect you. I'm trying to get this out today. Y'all stick with your boy. All right. If you are protecting your hurt, you about to get knocked out. So the girl lost the fight. She was a better boxer, but she went from offense to defense. You can't do that, people of God. That's what hurt does. Number three, hurt comes to contaminate your heart. It really does. So write this down. Hurt hurts the heart. There's a scripture in Proverbs that says, out of your heart flows the issues of life. Faith flows from your heart, not your heart beating the blood, the center of your existence, your spirit. (sighs) Belief flows out of the heart. Grace flows out of the heart. Love flows out of the heart. So you and I are challenged to guard our hearts above all else, for out of it flows the issues of life. Are you guys with me today? Hurt contaminates the heart. 
If you want intimacy with God this year, if you want to be close to Jesus this year, you have to have a pure heart. Matthew chapter 5 and 8, it says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall. How many of you all want to see God? Oh, no, baby. I want to see God in our marriage. I want to see God in our children. I want to see God in our investments. I want to see God in our. How many of y'all want to see God? You can't see God with a hurt heart. You see God with a pure heart. So we have to go through where we say, God, create in me a clean heart again, oh God. Let me have childlike faith again. I live in an information age that has cluttered my heart. I've been through things that have messed up my heart. God, do a new thing. Give me a new heart again. Are you with me today? Psalms 34 and 18, it says that the Lord is near to the brokenhearted, and he saves the what? Crushed in spirit. How many of you all have ever been, ever been brokenhearted before? Come on now. That ain't fun, is it? Did I ever tell you the story about when Tabitha broke my heart? Okay, stick around for one second. I got I to get this off my mind. We were madly in love, y'all, when we first met. Uh, my wife and I, we met on January 14th, 1998. And um, from that day, you couldn't separate us. I mean, we were together about every day from that day. We were like a Hallmark movie. We were so in love, right? But Tabitha had kind of failed out of college a couple of times, stopped and started, stopped and started. So she got this bright idea that she's going to join the military. So she signed up for the ROTC as her way of getting out of college and going on with her life. Now, she got a new man, and she was going to drag me through the military with her, and that's, that's okay. Thank God for those of you all who serve. But so what happened is that um, from January to June, we're in love. And then she goes to basic training in Fort Knox, Kentucky. She goes away for about six weeks. And man, in, in basic training, they just trigger some past stuff. You know, she's out there putting the AK-47 together. <laughs> she's jumping out of a plane. She wants to be G.I. Jane. She comes back. She don't need no man any longer. And I'm writing her love letters. I'm writing her love letters like, look, when you come back, sweetheart, I can't wait to see you again, right? So I heard that she had come back from basic training, and I went and got a bouquet of flowers, and I'm going to surprise her. I drove three hours and surprised her, knocked on her door with a bouquet of flowers. A bouquet, how you say that? I don't know. <laughs> and I gave her the flowers, and she looked at me like, who are you, almost? Like, like <laughs> you know, because she, she, when she gets nervous, she laughs. <laughs> I could tell that there's something was wrong. Right? She ends up breaking up with me. And my heart was broken to a million little pieces. All over the place. It was so bad, man. It was so bad. I was like, we were so good. And then we were so bad. It was so good until it wasn't. My heart was broken. Now, I don't know how long this lasted. It might have been like four weeks, but it felt like four years. And um, in that four weeks, she got saved. She got water baptized, and she start going to church. And God brought her all the way back around to me. And I'm still upset about it, you can tell. 25 years later, but when I look back on it, 25 years ago, God was near to the brokenhearted. And he helped me, and I didn't even know that I needed help. He was near to me. He was letting me know, it's gonna be okay. She's gonna come back around. Now she's my best friend, and praise God that he's near to the brokenhearted. Come on, somebody. Psalms 147, it says, praise the Lord. How good is it to sing praises to our God? How pleasant and fitting to praise him. The Lord builds up Jerusalem and gathers the exiles from Israel. But watch verse 3. Let's read it together. Ready, read. He heals the brokenhearted, and he binds up their wounds. We have too many wounded warriors sitting in the pews today. I love you enough to be honest with you. There's too many wounded warriors that are sitting in the pews today. They're sitting on their gifts that they should be using. And God wants to reactivate you and re-enlist you back into the army of the Lord. You know, the worst pain that I've ever experienced was about eight to 10 years ago. And uh, we were doing very well in ministry, but God gave me like a new vision. And he says, I want this church to resemble heaven. And my vision was that we could be a church of white people, black people, brown people, and yellow people that wouldn't just unite because of the pigment of our skin, but because of the power of the Holy Spirit in the atmosphere. And I began to change the church culturally just to let everybody know, no matter what background you're from, that you're welcome here. And I thought 
that the Christians would love it. Because, I mean, we read the Great Commission. It says, go to all nations. That is a multi-ethnic command. Go to all nations. And the only way you do that is with intentionality. And I thought the people that says, I got your back, Pastor. We're going to build this together. I thought they would go along with me. (laughs) I was laughed at. I was ridiculed, abandoned, betrayed just because I was obeying God. And I was wounded. I remember it got so bad that I didn't even want to come to my own church. You know, I remember like, I don't want to change lives anymore. I don't want to preach anymore. I want to go back to real estate. I want to do something different. I remember I was so wounded that we would have get togethers over my house. I would stay in my room. I didn't want to see the people any longer. And man, when I look back, I say, thank God for a good wife. Because when I was down, she was there to pick me up and say, baby, you still got a call of God on your life. God still wants to do great things on the inside of you. Thank God that I had some people that just stood by my side. They're still a part of our church, our Gainesville campus today. And they just stuck with me and they prayed with me because even though they might not have been able to see what I was able to see, thank God they hung around so we could see what we see today. But now that I look back 10 years ago, God was healing my broken heart and he was binding my wound. And maybe you don't have a ministry wound today. Maybe you have a marriage wound. Maybe you have an emotional wound. Maybe you have some, a financial wound. I want you to know that God wants to bind up your wounds today. You know, God doesn't want us to be the people that are bleeding for years. There comes a place where scabbing needs to happen, then a scar, because we should be the scar generation. Like, I don't look like what I've been through, y'all. And the scar don't hurt no more. The scar to me just is... Battle wounds to let you know what I've been through. And I had a test that God's given me a testimony and a mess that God's given me a message. And I've come out of the fire and I'm not even smelling like smoke. We don't want to be the broken people sitting around saying, oh, I don't want to get too involved. I don't want to give. I tried that before. And there's too many hurt people. And God wants to heal our wounds today. One more scripture. Let's look at Matthew chapter number 11. And by the way, I'm glad I ain't give up. Because our church is glorious. Does anybody believe that or is it just me? Am I fool? I believe our church is glorious. How many of you all speak a different language? Let me see by a show of hands. You speak a different language. Holler out, man, real quick. What you speak? I can't hear that all at the same time. My bad. Creole, Spanish, Arabic, Portuguese, French, German, a beautiful church. Satan tried to kill me before we even see this come to pass. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 tells us what to do. Can we read this together? Ready, read. Come to me, all ye who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. Come on. For my yoke is easy and my burden Say it again. For my yoke is easy. Come on. And my, one more time. For my yoke is easy and my what? Burden is light. You know, nothing about life seems light or easy. It all seems hard and heavy. The only way for it to be light and easy is that you got to come to Jesus. Come on, y'all. And coming to Jesus is not you just lifting up your hand at the end of the service. That's the beginning. That's not the ending. Coming to Jesus is a lifestyle. That I'm going to come to Jesus every day. Scratch that. I'm going to come to Jesus in every moment of every day. Come on. I'm going to come to Jesus. Which way should I go to work? Who should I talk to? Should I respond to that text? How should I respond? Should I marry this person? Should I go on that date? Should I not? Should I take this job? Should I go to this church? What should I get involved in? Jesus, I need to come to you every, in every play, in every way. How many of y'all want to live a life that's light? His burden is easy and his yoke is light. This year of communion is about us coming to Jesus, coming to his presence, coming to his word. We don't go to the bottle, we go to the Bible. I need more wordplay. We don't go to the weed, we go to the word. We don't go to the porno, we go to the Prince of Peace. We don't go online, we go 
I don't know, it kind of fell off a little bit, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was doing good for a minute, but I don't know what happened. You know, I was just in Brazil with 15,000 young adults, and there's a fire in the nation. A, 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 a tangible fire that gets on you. And I came back and I was talking to people and they was like, oh man, Brazil this and other nations this. But I'm here to prophesy that God wants to bring revival to America. I got three people, I'm sorry, I gotta put the mic to my, I got three people that understand. God wants to bring revival in our generation. God wants to bring revival to America. Anybody ready for another great awakening? Anybody ready for another Azusa Street? Come on, God's ready to bring revival to America. We're not just gonna watch other nations. Do I got any fire in the house? Do I got any passion in the house? And what I've learned is that Florida is a forerunner state. And many times what God wants to do in the nation, he starts it in Florida. And when God wants to move by his power in Florida, he looks for life-giving churches filled with the spirit that resembles heaven. And when God looks for life-giving churches that are filled with the spirit that resembles heaven, God knows we are a part of that crowd. So what does that mean? That revival starts in here. Revival doesn't just start in here. It starts in me and it starts in you and it changes America. And where America goes, so goes the world. How many of you all are ready not to come to revival? Revival, but carry revival. Do I got any revival starters in the house today? Come on, somebody. It's time to prophesy again. It's time to raise the dead again. Our God is not dead and he's not done. Are y'all with me today? Get three people around you and say, it's time to come to Jesus. It's time. Woo. Can we start there today? Coming to Jesus, everybody be seated. I want to give you an opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Some of you all have heard about Jesus. And you've considered him, but you haven't fully submitted your life today yet. The Bible says the day you hear my voice, don't harden your heart. And that's what some people do. They harden their heart instead of having a heart of faith. You don't have to be perfect to be saved, but you do have to surrender. And you don't have to know the whole Bible to be saved. You just got to take a step. And God says, when you take a step towards me, I'm going to take two towards you. And so with every head bowed, every eye closed, let's make this between you and your master. If you're here today and you say, Pastor Ken, I've sinned in my life. You're in good company, my guy. The Bible says that we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. You cannot be good enough to pay the price of your own sin. So the Father put his only begotten Son, Jesus, on the cross, and he paid the price for all of our sins. Seven billion people all around the world, past, present, and future. And all we have to do to be right with God is to accept what Jesus has done. And if you're here today, I would love to pray for you. I consider this to be the most important and powerful prayer that you could ever pray. You're saying, you know what, I want to be saved today. I want to put my trust in Jesus. I want to be forgiven of my sins. I want to be a child of God. And if that bears witness with you, could I pray for you? And if with every head bowed and eye closed, if you say, yeah, pastor, you can pray for me. On the count of three, I'm going to ask you to boldly lift up your hand and just wave at me so that I can know who I'm praying for. And then I'm going to acknowledge you and you can put your hand down. And we're going to pray and your life will never be the same again. And so if that's you online or here in this service today, this is your moment. Don't let the devil steal it from you. If you say, Pastor, I want to be forgiven of my sins. I don't want a religion, but I do want a relationship with my maker. On the count of three, lift up your hand. One, two, three. Boldly. Lift it up by faith and just say, yeah, that's me. I see your hand and your hand and your hand and your hand and your hand. Your hand and your hand and your hand and your hand. And your hand 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 and your hand. Your hand, 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 your hand. Is there anybody else? Is there anybody else? You should have lifted it, but you didn't. Now's your time. Just slip it up right where you are. Just slip it up. Just slip it up. Just slip it up right where you are. You can put your hands down. And we're going to call on the name of the Lord. The Bible says when you call on his name, you'll be saved. Are you ready? Say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart today. Forgive me of my sins. From this day forward, I surrender all of me for all of you. 
Lord, thank you for saving my soul, dying on a cross just for me. Be the Lord of my life, the Savior of my soul. I surrender all. In Jesus' name.